There we go. Awesome. Now you can definitely hear me. Um, so, my name is uh, Lauren Voswinkel. Like, uh, like was said, I work at New Relic on the past team. We're actually looking to be hiring new people for, uh, for a team that's either the past team or adjacent to the past team. So uh, if you're looking for a job, you should totally apply. We do awesome work. <laughs> and Scott, our hiring manager, is right over there, who is the first to start clapping. <laughs> so uh, I'm here because I wanted to talk about service-oriented architecture, actually. Um, it's, something, it's, it's a bit of a buzzword in a lot of ways. Um, and it's something that a lot of people know about and really want to start doing, but don't really know how to get from their existing application to service-oriented architecture. So I'm going to start with a basic definition of what a service is. Uh, a service is an unassociated, loosely coupled, self-contained unit of functionality. The hell does that mean? Uh, it basically means that it does one thing and one thing well, and thus is a singularly focused application. Um, the benefits of moving, of extracting services and moving to a software, uh, a service-oriented architecture, uh, is that you get some asynchronicity. You can set it up so that your uh, your client UI is able to hit and retrieve data from all of your various services without any type of, without having to refresh the entire page. You could basically make Ajax calls to it. Uh, it works very well with existing front end frameworks, Angular, uh, React, uh, and things like that. Um, it also means that if you're doing multiple, if you're gathering a lot of information or a lot of data, you can actually retrieve you can send out multiple calls using, uh, say, like a multi-threaded, uh, a multi-threaded library that can then retrieve all of that information at the same time, rather than doing uh, all of the steps in parallel. Um, so it basically allows you to kind of get significantly more CPU power for uh, loading a single page if you set up the set up the architecture properly. Uh, and that's what I was trying to say with the parallelizable. It's been a while since I've given this talk, so uh, you'll have to excuse me. So the asynchronicity basically means that you can uh, fire off requests and continue processing other things. Parallelizable means that you can send off multiple requests and have all of that information be processed on different servers uh, and then come back roughly at the same time, thus decreasing your, your overall load time. Uh, loose coupling, which ends up being it, making it so that you can uh, modify an existing system uh, or service without affecting the rest of your uh, the rest of your overall application. So if a single service goes down, it's not going to potentially drag other parts of the system down with it. Uh, the loose coupling also means that you end up with faster test suites when you make a change in one of your in one of your services. It ends up being able to be have a, a much tighter feedback loop. You don't need to wait 15 minutes, 30 minutes for an entire suite to run uh, when you're only making a very small change. Um, because of the loose coupling and because of the faster test, it's often easier to extend and change. You, because of that tight feedback loop, you're much more confident in what you're actually changing and you're able to uh, you're able to, oh brain, uh, it basically just makes it so that you are capable of more confidently changing things and because of that confidence you are more likely to write better tests as well. Um, so the system is significantly more malleable. Uh, all of this comes down to an increased velocity which is a great way to sell it to your manager. How do you actually do it, though? I went to conferences a lot when this was a hot button topic, um, where everybody was talking about service-oriented architecture, and everybody was talking about like how you could build a service or why you would want to build ser like services. 
and all I ever wanted was a talk about how to take my existing application and extract services from it. And I never got that talk. I often felt like when forced to work uh, work in a system where we where we needed to extract something, that it was a very painful situation and really clumsy and awkward. <laughs> um, so I'm here to give that talk about how to do this. So let's get started. The first step in building a service, or extracting a service, is determining what the service is actually going to do. If you already have your application set up, you know where the pain points are. You know where you need to improve performance or where you need to or where you're making the most change. So those those points of of contention are the best places to look to extract a service. I'm sorry if I'm not looking over to this side of the room. There's an amazing glare over there. <laughs> um, so the first step is to determine what the service is actually going to end up doing. Um, like I said before, services should be singularly focused. They should do one thing well. Thank you so much. Um, they should do one and only one thing well. Effectively, you're not building applications that are able to serve any and all needs. Um, you're building a service that will take care of login and session storage, or that will take care of processing transactions, or that will take care of providing information about, uh, about your products. Those are the things that you, that you should be focusing on with an application rather than just, this, pro this service is for users. The hell does that actually mean? Are you doing session stuff? Are you taking in information about like the user's address where you're shipping things, you really need to be very, very focused in where you're, how you're building your services. The next step after you know what your service is going to be doing is to create the endpoints for that service. Um, what exactly are the endpoints of your service? That really depends. If you're doing a session, uh, a login or session storage, you need a place to uh, to send new session information, you need a place to validate uh, validate given credentials, and you need a place to be able to destroy that session, um, and potentially another place to make sure that that person is actually logged in. So those are the those are going to be the endpoints that you're looking for. How is the user, or how is your your client side application, or how is another service going to interact with this one? Typically, in our Ruby and Rails type world, this, is, this means that you're going to be building controllers. Uh, those controllers, uh, again, thinking about the, the session storage, uh, might be a, a session controller to uh, be able to pull information about existing sessions, and a login controller that actually does the validation of information. Then you're going to be determining request options. And what I mean by this is, what is your service actually looking for when somebody hits an endpoint? Do they need account IDs? Do they need, uh, can they accept multiple accounts in a particular uh, request? How are you going to do any type of, of filtering on result sets that come back from your service? So you need to, you need to know how your information is mutable and how flexible those endpoints are going to be. Again, the f is it going to accept filters for responses? Can you, can, you send, uh, can you send parameters to the service that say, I only care about these things in your response? Are you able to get multiple objects per request? Can you send a set of IDs that then get back a, an array of, uh, of responses. These, again, are the questions that you need to, to answer when you're building the controllers. Uh, at my last job where I built this talk, uh, we decided on using a, uh, a gem called Active Model Serializers. What Active Model Serializers do is they give you the ability to create classes 
that define all of these things. They define uh, the various attributes that are going to be coming back in the response, and they can define uh, any associations with those objects so that when you get back a city, excuse me, in this particular case, there is a country object embedded inside of that that also comes back on the request. It's amazingly important to write tests for your controllers in this particular case. I seriously mean that you need to write tests because what those tests are is a contract is is the contract that your service fulfills. It says when I get this information, I actually return uh, this response. It's a way that you can effectively publish your API without actually having to write documentation. If you're not writing tests, I can't trust your service. The next thing is to create client models. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, don't use plain responses. Um, when somebody's interacting with your service, make it easier for them to, to consume the data. Make it, uh, if, if you're using only one language, um, like in, at uh, my last company, we were primarily a Ruby shop, then you should build something that allows your consumers to easily uh, interact with the responses that you're, that you're giving back. Um, the way that I built this uh, at my last company was kind of hilarious. It was um, basically a lot of metaprogramming that you could give it uh, that you could give it a hash, and it would take that like a uh, a JSON response, and it would take that JSON response, turn it into a hash, and then take that hash, and basically create the actual model objects that were coming back from that hash for you. Uh, you look on line nine, there's like uh, information looking for particular client models. If a class was described, it would instantiate one of those classes. Uh, if, there was a, um, if there was an array that came back, then it, would, then it would basically try to inspect a single object inside of that array and then build models for all of the objects in that array. A lot of the models that were defined were very simple. They just were saying, yes, this is actually a valid object that I, that I want you to be able in, to interact with. Going back, you see uh, at the bottom, there's the define singleton methods uh, for the keys. It was basically just taking the keys, saying, yes, this is a method that you can actually call on it. Uh, we were previously using something called HashiMash, which has a kind of side effect where you can ask, send any message to it, and it will just blindly return nil to anything that it doesn't understand. This was created to basically say, hey, you sent me something that I have no clue what it actually is. But it was flexible enough that it was easy to define for pretty much anything. If you wanted to change the behavior on one of the objects that came back, you could throw it into the class in the client model. And it would just take all of that. It, it, would, it would modify the behavior that you were expecting. Uh, at my last job, I was also doing payment stuff. So it's a good fit for me here. <laughs> um, this is amazing for rapid prototyping. It's really bad for everything else. With your client models, again, you're going to want to write tests. You need to write tests for everything that you're, everything that you're working with. Because what these tests represent is that they're proof that your service hasn't actually changed. If you're writing both a client that's consuming information and the service, and your tests on your client break, that means that you've changed your service enough that you need to update how clients are consuming information, whether that's updating your docs or whether that's updating your client libraries. So after that, you need to create a communication layer. What this basically means is you need to find a gem. I don't suggest writing this by yourself. Um, there's a lot of gems out there that are able to make requests to various, uh, typically to REST APIs and whatnot. 
Um, the one that I typically recommend is Typhus, and the reason why I recommend it is because it allows for concurrent requests. You can uh, queue up multiple requests. Say if you're trying to pull in, I don't know, a hundred different, a uh, hundred different objects, and you want them fast but in full detail rather than like the index providing just uh, standard uh, kind of like abbreviated responses. This will allow you to queue up 10 or so of them at a time and send them all at the same time so that you only have effectively one round trip to get 10 objects back. Uh, it's a really interesting and useful way to cut down on uh, client side uh, load times in particular. But when I say this, you really should wrap your gem. If you're using something like HTT Party or uh, really any type of library to actually go out and re make requests to your service from a client, um, you need, you absolutely need to actually wrap your gem so that you're abstracting the gem's behavior from your actual code. That way, when the gem changes, because it's always going to change unless it's dead, you have that one place where you can go where you make those changes that they made. This is a really great example of someone not wrapping their gems that were making various calls. And this was an incredibly painful migration going from 2.3 to 3. It was abysmal. If you wrapped active record and used that kind of uh, domain specific language, like created your own like domain specific language or at least your own methods to interact with that with active record, it would have made that process a lot easier. But we didn't because that wasn't the Rails way. Bonus step, if you've now created client models and a communication layer, this gives you a gem. I mean a gem. There you go. <laughs> um, basically what I mean by this is um, if you're actually providing a way for your services to interact uh, internally in your, com in your company um, and you're pro providing the uh, transmission method, go ahead and make it a gem. Go ahead and make it some type of library that, uh, that other people could use if you're uh, if your project ends up going public. Um, also, if other, if other teams in your company need to interact with that service, having that gem in place to just drop into a gem file is a really, really fantastic way to, to make them happy rather than forcing them to, uh, to use client models that they cobble together. So now that you've kind of ended up extracting the mod, like the client models that you're you're looking for, uh, and you've created the endpoints for your new service, it's time to actually sever the dependencies. When you've been working in a in an application that's been relying on database calls, um, you need to be able to to break that dependency on the, on the database and start relying on the service that you're creating. And it involves replacing those database calls with the calls directly to your service. Uh, again, if you've extra abstracted that into uh, a Ruby gem, it's going to be fairly, it's going to be a little bit easier to, to interact with that or for other people to interact with your new service uh, rather than having to uh, to redo some of the work that you've already done. You're creating a gap in this particular play, uh, question. Yeah, so you're specifically talking about service-to-service -service communication rather than like a web front-end to a service? Um, it's, it really depends. The web front-end to, to service kind of um, was one of the things that we were actually dealing with, but it was embedded in the Rails application. It wasn't. It wasn't a front-end framework. Uh, it was the UI being served statically from the from the Ruby monolith. 
And so we needed to create the service and then we needed to have the, the, the other part of our application that was creating those static responses communicate with the new service. We built them kind of in place in the same, uh, in the same repository uh, and then kind of ended up having to tease things out slowly over time. And this, like, this discussion is, is about that like, unteasing of all the, the dependencies. Yeah. So um, it's really easy to get burned by this part. Severing dependencies, actually, like removing data uh, reliance on database, is one of the most difficult things that you can do in a particular application. Uh, I know in now in at two jobs that I've had. It's been the biggest stumbling block of, hey, we want to create a new service. Oh, we're going to continue using the existing database. That is a very quick way to kind of kill the concept of a, of a new service. Um, so it's one of the, it's one of the biggest uh, difficulties because of how integrated Active Record is into a lot of Rails applications. Um, if you're working in other, uh, in other frameworks, Often the database is still just really, really tangled and gnarly in that particular context. So taking the time and doing this particular step right is what's going to make or break your ability to, to actually extract the application, or the new service, rather. It's important to note that if you're working in Rails, and you're building out this uh, this new service in your existing repository that you really need a multi-request server because you need something that's able to serve the page that you are already that already existed, but then also respond to the uh, to the requests coming in from the from basically that divide. So in this particular case, where when I was working at Living Social. Um, we had uh, our UI basically making HTTP requests to the, uh, to the new service, but hadn't created that code separation. And so it was basically serving up multiple requests, even though it was only one request. And this is what I refer to as the web brick wall, um, because you would make the original request that would be dependent on, the other, on, on a service request. And so that original request would just sit there and wait for that service request to come in. And wait. And wait. And then it would eventually time out, and then this one would come in and be like, here's your stuff. Uh, you're not there anymore. So it's really important that you have some type of multi-threaded server that's able to respond to multiple requests uh, when, you're building the same, when you're building out your service in the same code base. After you, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you just use like a, an nginx facade? Yeah. Uh, nginx would be perfectly fine. Uh, honestly, uh, I believe thin is per perfectly fine. Unicorn's fine. Like anything that isn't just like single threat, like single re response comes in, I wait and do that thing before I can respond to anything else. So. Uh, the next step after you've actually created that, that separation and you now have effectively two systems existing in that same code base is that you need to improve the service performance. A round trip over the internet, even if it's going just directly to your local host, is still going to be a longer process than your database calls. Uh, the tools that I use for this, uh, for, for service, like performance improvement, uh, if you're using Ruby 2.1 and above, StackProf is a fantastic way to go. And perftools.rb if you're using things that are not as shiny as Ruby 2.1. Um, perftools was the one that I was more, most familiar with, and it's the one that I'm going to be talking about here, because typically speaking, if you're dealing with a really nasty monolith, you're not using the newest and shiniest things. So uh, this is the output from perftools. It's really terrifying. I honestly, when I first looked at this, I was like, what the hell am I even looking at? 
if you look at line two, 64.3% of the time of, this, of any request that came through was spent in the garbage collector. We were building lots of objects. But how do we actually use this output? If you look all the way to the left, there's just a, a number, then there's a percentage, and then another percentage, and then another number, and another percentage. Um, I completely ignore the first three columns and only focus on the, the, uh, the last two next to the actual names. Uh, the first column is the number of samples that that particular method shows up in, that, in, in the call stack when it's profiling it as the active call stack. The percentage next to it is the percentage of that time. The percentage next to that is an aggregate of all of the percent uh, of the percent that it added and everything above it. So if you look, the, the, third, uh, the third column is just increasing steadily. Uh, the next set of numbers over here is the number of times that it shows up in the stack and any, anything that it might be depending on or it has called is showing up in the stack. So time.utc has 6.6% uh, of the time actually working in time.utc, and then it has an additional 0.7% of time that it's called something else, and so it's not the active thing, but it's gonna get back to time.utc. And so that these numbers here are how I spend most of my time when I'm using perf tools. How? Um, typically do a search for the objects that you're actually interested in or trying to find. You're looking for things that you actually wrote and are interacting with. In this case, the active model serializers were a big point of like what I actually cared about. I can't really do anything about the garbage collection time directly, but I can improve this 35.7% of the time that remained. Um, and if you look, the 64.3% of time in the garbage collector plus the 35.7% of the time is the 100% of the time uh, for the overall call. So I'm dealing with that 35.7% of the time as my full window. So like if I look down at line 264, that 27.7% of time is really more like two thirds of the actual time that I'm, that's being spent in the application. A little confusing, but it's really, really helpful. Um, and then as you kind of dive into that more and more and you're looking at like the fact that uh, I think it was as JSON was the, the entry point for, um, for hitting the active model serializers, you dig down into that looking at as JSON and that comes into, into the actual deal, serial, deal serializers that were being, uh, that were being presented. And then there's the fast attributes, which were creating the actual list of all of what was, uh, the actual, it was actually populating the information. Um, and so you kind of step through your call stack as you're looking at this, this output, finding where you're spending the most time in, in code that you actually wrote. The 8.0% was about 20% of the actual time that that was the request was actually um, processing. So that's a good chunk of where I could spend time focusing. 5.9% of that time was spent in the gross sales method. So that method could be cleaned up quite a bit to get a decent performance uh, performance improvement. It's basically stepping through everything to get at the nuggets of where you're going to be able to make improvements. When I went into that, there were these calculator coupons uh, methods. And all of a sudden we see the times jump up to 21.5% of the time. That's because it's not just called by that gross sales. It's called by other places. And so this is giving a, a bigger point period, uh, a bigger amount of time being spent in that particular method. And so when I was looking at everything, calculator coupons 
was the place that I needed to focus for any type of uh, performance improvements. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of how to do uh, how to use perf tools or stack prof. I could probably give a, another full talk about how to use those tools that would make a lot more sense than what I just went over. Um, it would involve code sample. Yeah. So the weighted graph is terrible for Rails. It is absolutely abysmal. So if you look on the, if you look at these numbers here, most of them are just like zero. They don't show up really on like as active parts of the call stack. Those numbers get pr those uh, those calls get pruned from the from, from the weighted graph, and so they're just completely useless in a Rails environment. In other non-Rails environments where there's not like literally hundreds upon hundreds of calls to various methods that you have no control over, the weighted graph is a fantastic way to go. Not for Rails so much. <laughs> it, again, it, it, because it drops most of the places where your code actually is, it's not the best way because if we go back to to this like most of the time is spent in the garbage collector in time.utc in mysql2 uh each that's not i can't i can't modify those to improve performance and so you need to figure out what are the things calling all of those things and that's what diving into the into the actual text stack and finding out that like Two thirds of the time spent is is in this particular method in code that we wrote. So, anyways, I could give an, like I said I could give a whole other talk on just using those tools to uh, to help improve performance. And nothing against New Relic, I love the product. This is a little bit more granular. <laughs> that being said, you can't run this in production either. <laughs> It is a it is a stop and check rather than uh, rather than something that can just uh, run in the background. So uh, the thing to do after that is extracting the tables and the database, uh, f like from your existing database to its own database, so that you're not relying on the same structures anymore, um, and extracting the actual service that you've now built. And are communicating with from the original code base. Uh, the extraction from from the code base is pretty simple. All of your code should be in its own nice little classes that can be removed because there's no more dependencies besides that HTTP con connection. Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, I welcome any questions on this particular topic. So uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards or ask for any clarifications on anything. Uh, and I would probably be more than willing to turn it into a its own talk as well. <laughs> uh, that's it. Again, Lauren Vosswinkel. <laughs>